Welcome to Provisional Aspirations, a podcast exploring the psychology of religion, philosophy, and clinical mental health. I'm Jeffrey Wallace, author, religious trauma survivor, and graduate student pursuing a master's degree in counseling psychology. Join me as I indulge my academic interest in the human spiritual experience, a curiosity that I couldn't fully explore as a member of a high demand religious group. But now I'm learning out loud and it feels great. Faith is a funny word, inspiring for some, triggering for others. Faith is often considered to be synonymous with belief, a concept set aside for those of a religious persuasion, and it's placed in contrast to the intellectual and scientific rigors of secular thought. But if you hail from an ultra-religious upbringing like myself, you'll know all too well that in many circles, discussions of faith go far beyond just run-of-the-mill belief. From a psychological perspective, though, what is faith? We could dismiss faith as only for the religious, but perspectives from evolutionary biology challenge us to think about religion and human spirituality, or at least their psychological underpinnings, as ubiquitous human experiences manifest across the epochs in disparate cultures from all over the globe. It appears that the human spiritual disposition will be more pronounced in some over others. You can see my article about the genetic correlates of spiritual melancholy that I've linked in the show notes. But regardless, it seems that spirituality is not so much an intellectual or political choice, but rather a tendency of human psychology. This perspective is shared by the late James W. Fowler, a United Methodist minister and professor of theology and human development at Emory University. Fowler is best known for his 1981 book, Stages of Faith, which is still referenced in undergraduate psychology textbooks and also recently appeared on my radar again in a lifespan development course that was part of my graduate level clinical counseling program. The reason that the work of a Methodist minister has made its way to a Master of Science program is that his work draws not just from his own Christian sentiments, but from the theoretical perspectives of the great names in developmental psychology that preceded him, including the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, who developed a framework for the cognitive development of children, Eric Erickson, who created an eight-stage framework for psychosocial development across the lifespan, and Lawrence Kohlberg, who developed a six-stage model for morality in humans. Fowler applies this same developmental perspective to the maturation of faith across the lifespan. In the copy of Stages of Faith that I have, Fowler goes so far as to create a fictional dialogue between the aforementioned, his three favorite developmental psychologists, as if to demonstrate that what he goes on to say about faith is based not on his belief biases, but on established lifespan development psychology. In short, Fowler knows his shit. I've been told that in religious circles, Fowler's work has been taken slightly out of context and is instead used as a sort of roadmap for the ambitious Christian religionist. This appears to be a common use of psychological research in general, that it's often taken out of context of the observation of human behavior and cognition and is presented to the public almost as a way of hacking our human experience, using emerging psychological and neuroscientific knowledge to optimize our human experience, whether it be in the pursuit of improved performance in memory, efficiency, happiness, relationships, or self-knowledge. And in religious communities, faith development can be pursued with the same sort of earnest, almost aggressively. Indeed, numerous passages in the New Testament appeal to the devout to make spiritual advancement and to attain maturity and the measure of stature that belongs to the fullness of the Christ. Ephesians 4.13. That is to say that I hope reference to Fowler's work in this episode is not off-putting to my listeners who know the perils of obsessive desire for religious purity, that sort of scrupulosity that plagued me as a Jehovah's Witness. Personal spiritual ambition combined with community competition for mystical one-upmanship. But surely we're all past that now. Famously, Fowler presents six stages of faith. But in addition to this, he provides a definition of faith that is of value not only to the spiritual seeker, the person who, like myself, seeks to understand the role of spirituality in the human experience, but also to those who consider themselves firmly in the secular camp. In this, I think Fowler's perspective on faith, albeit from the religious or spiritual perspective, can be of introspective value to all of us. Fowler puts it this way, faith, 
rather than belief or religion, is the most fundamental category in the human quest for relation to transcendence. Faith, it appears, is generic, a universal feature of human living. This is eerily familiar. I'm sure I've given dozens of religious sermons centered around the definition of faith, mostly based on the biblical definition at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Pardon me as I indulge in a bit of deconstruction. St. Paul says that faith is the assured expectation of things hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities, though not beheld. And I quote from memory from the New World Translation, This assured expectation of things hoped for is the firm belief that a hoped-for future, as presented in a holy book, will certainly come to pass, and the somewhat dogged refusal to entertain the possibility that it might not. The evident demonstration of realities, though not beheld, suggests that real things that are unseen can be proved with evidence. This sort of evidence is a classic example of confirmation bias, as the Christian identifies experiences that reconfirm their beliefs, either in the existence of an omnipotent God, his interference in their personal life, or the value of living based on religious principles. This sort of confirmation bias was also at the root of the creationist intelligent design movement. This opposes good science, of course, wherein one would present a hypothesis, let's say the existence of God, and seek evidence to falsify it, rather than confirm the claim. But I digress. Fowler's definition of faith is based on the psychological and is more robust. It can be applied to religious faith not only of the Christian persuasion, but all faith systems, and as I have argued, all ethical, moral, and value systems that may resonate with the secular thinker. Fowler sees faith as, and I quote, a human phenomenon, an apparently generic consequence of the universal human burden of finding or making meaning. Fowler describes faith as an operation of the human ability to imagine. He says that humans have the tendency to imagine an ultimate environment that shapes our worldview, value systems, thinking, and initiative. He puts it this way, Faith forms a way of seeing our everyday life in relation to holistic images of what we may call the ultimate environment. Human action always involves responses and initiatives. We shape our action, responses and initiatives, in accordance with what we see to be patterns of action and meaning. End quote. In essence, we imagine an ultimate environment and then form our actions based on this ideal. Fowler breaks down how this relates to individual cognitive systems and also social connection in the following quote. Faith, in its binding us to centers of value and power, and in its triadic joining of us into communities of shared trusts and loyalties, gives form and content to our imagining of an ultimate environment, end quote. In short, we use our capacity for imagination to create an image of an ultimate environment and then draw value systems and community connectivity from these images. Fowler clarifies that this is not just fantastic thinking. He says, and I quote, Imagination is not to be equated with fantasy or make-believe. Rather, imagination is a powerful force underlying all knowing. In faith, imagination composes comprehensive images of ultimate conditions of existence, end quote. Fowler admits that some would protest that they don't hold such an imagined ultimate environment. But he replies by saying this, and I quote, You may add that far from being ultimately concerned about such matters, you don't really have much concern about them at all. In response to this commonly stated position, I have to reply that the fact that an image of an ultimate environment is largely unconscious or tacitly held makes it no less influential or operative in a person's initiatives and responses in life. Similarly, the fact that one imagines the ultimate conditions of existence as impersonal, indifferent, hostile, or randomly chaotic, rather than as coherent and structured, does not disqualify his or her image as an operative image of faith. End quote. This made me think of the often repeated comment of the psychedelic advocate Terence McKenna, who famously stated, My technique is don't believe anything. If you believe in something, you are automatically precluded from believing its opposite. But even this perpetual suspension of belief is an imagined universal ideal from which a set of values, or in McKenna's case, negative values, could be drawn. 
and thus still constitutes a faith system. Fowler's not letting any of us off the hook. We can imagine a scientific or political ultimate environment and organize our responses and actions accordingly. Or we could believe that God is in control of everything and that everything on the earth happens for a reason. Or that the universe is an expanding mass of atomic energy that we happen to have evolved onto. Wherever we happen to fall, these are all ultimate environments that shape the way we develop our value systems and form communities. Faith can, by this definition, be framed as an individual or community experience. From the perspective of the individual, Fowler says this, again, broadening faith to the human rather than just the spiritual or religious, and I quote, We value that which seems of transcendent worth, and in relation to which our lives have worth. Further, in a world of powerful forces that have an impact on us, enlarging and diminishing us, forming and sometimes destroying us, we invest loyalty in and seek to align ourselves with powers that promise to sustain our lives and to undergird more being. The centers of value and power that have God value for us, therefore, are those that confirm meaning and worth on us and promise to sustain us in a dangerous world of power." End quote. In this sense, then, faith is a reaction to the power structures in the world around us. Perhaps it is that in moments when our brute force or powers of intellect fail us in social gameplay, or when we are threatened with elimination from natural powers beyond our control, we draw strength from centers of value and power that are based on our epitomized ultimate environment. From this we gain a sort of conciliatory power that sustains us, revitalizes us, or consoles us. According to Fowler, faith becomes a communal matter when the images of ultimate environment are similar among people, that is, they are shared. He puts it this way, and I quote, In each of the roles we play, in each significant relationship we have with others, in each institution of which we are a part, we are linked to others in shared trusts and loyalties, to centers of value and power. In each of these contexts, we serve common goals, we hold shared meanings, we remember shared stories, we celebrate and renew common hopes. Our identity and our faith must somehow bring these diverse roles, contexts, and meanings into an integrated, workable unity." End quote. So I challenge you then for a moment to think about your images of an ultimate environment and how you might be drawing your systems of value and power from them as we move on to the discussion of James Fowler's Six Stages of Faith. Fowler begins in infancy to age three with what he calls undifferentiated faith. He refers to the undifferentiated phase of infancy as a pre-stage that precedes his subsequent six stages of faith. It's during this time of a child's life when they have their first experiences of mutuality, that is the sharing of feeling, action, or relationship between them and their caregivers. Fowler states, and I quote, our first pre-images of God have their origins here. Particularly, they are composed from our first experiences of mutuality, in which we form the rudimentary awareness of self as separate from and dependent upon the immensely powerful others." End quote. Again, Fowler's definition of faith involves values from which we draw strength when faced with threats from more powerful forces in our world. Thus, during the undifferentiated pre-stage, and I quote, the seeds of trust, courage, hope, and love are fused in an undifferentiated way, and contend with sense threats of abandonment, inconsistencies, and deprivations in an infant's environment." End quote. He goes on to say that the emergent strength of faith in this stage is the fund of basic trust and the relational experience of mutuality with the ones providing primary love and care. Even in unfortunate circumstances where such care is not provided, the faith system can still find its roots but yield value systems based on isolation and lack of trust, as is the case in the self-sufficient and exploitative values of adult narcissism. Let's move on to stage one, intuitive projective faith, ages two to six. Based on the research from the developmental psychologists, Fowler reiterates that a child of this age, and I quote, uses the new tools of speech and symbolic representation to organize her or his sensory experience into meaning units, end quote. The child begins to use imagination to bring sense to the language, symbols, actions, moods, and stories of the adults in their lives. They're not inhibited by logical thought at this time, 
and therefore create elaborate fantasies based on the stories that they hear from others. This is the sort of storybooking ideals of fairy tales. Fowler modestly includes biblical stories among these fairy tales, as is warranted given the way they're presented in Christian children's storybooks at this age. The imaginative stories that the child develops can have long-lasting emotional reinforcers. Fowler says that these emotional reinforcers will have to be sorted out by later, more stable and self-reflective valuing and thinking. At this point, Fowler also boldly calls out a danger that exists at this stage in the faith development, which struck a nerve for me, as I know it will with my listeners who may be recovering from religious trauma PTSD. Fowler states that, and I quote, the dangers in this stage arise from the possible possession of the child's imagination by unrestrained images of terror and destructiveness, or from the witting and unwitting exploitation of her or his imagination in the reinforcement of taboos and moral or doctrinal expectations. Possession is a strong word. Fowler goes on, and I quote, There are religious groups who subject intuitive projective children to the kind of preaching and teaching that vividly emphasizes the pervasiveness and power of the devil, the sinfulness of all people without Christ, and the hell of fiery torments that await the unrepentant. This kind of faith formation, and its equivalent in other religious traditions, can ensure a dramatic conversion experience by the time the child is seven or eight. It runs the grave risk, however, of leading to precocious identity formation, in which the child, at conversion, takes on the adult faith identity called for by the religious group. This often results when the child is an adult in the emergence of a very rigid, brittle, and authoritarian personality, end quote. I can't help thinking about a video presented at a regional convention of Jehovah's Witnesses about five years ago, depicting worldly forces as masked soldiers fit with assault rifles, surrounding a defenseless group of Jehovah's Witnesses, adults and children, in the center of a field, who awaited obediently for the hand of Jehovah's salvation. This frightening scene was shown before an audience of families, some with children in the intuitive projective years, who no doubt also knew the stories of the destruction of the unrighteous in the flood, the later raising of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire and hail, not to mention dozens of Bible stories of rape, war, and murder, some that were graphically represented in colorful books given to children to pacify them during law and birth sermons. I won't go on. But the naivete of parents who believed that they were safe to allow the Lord to mold their children in these formative years, and the religious leaders who ignorantly and arrogantly proliferated such material, has led to a generation of recoverers who now face the therapeutic challenge of parsing the traumatic emotional reactions associated with these imaginative stories of their youth from the realities of an adult social world. Hashtag religious trauma gang. Stage two, mythic literal faith, ages seven to 12. This stage is identified by the narrative nature of the developing faith. In this stage, says Fowler, and I quote, there is a more linear narrative construction of coherence and meaning. Story becomes the major way of giving unity and value to experience, end quote. Interestingly, this is the first stage that Fowler identifies in which an individual can stagnate well into adulthood. Fowler includes some interview content in stages of faith to demonstrate this. Perhaps you too can think of some adults who can't seem to conceptualize their value system outside of just talking about their personal experiences and how they might compare or contrast to your own. Fowler says that individuals in this faith stage, and I quote, do not step back from the flow of stories to formulate reflective conceptual meanings. For this stage, the meaning is both carried and trapped in the narrative, end quote. As an aside, Eric Erickson's approach to development across the lifespan suggests that individuals face crises, the resolution of which pushes them into a new lifespan phase. In the case of stage two faith, Fowler states, the implicit clash or contradiction in stories that leads to reflection on meaning can lead an individual to stage three. Stage three. Synthetic conventional faith. Fowler aligns this phase with psychosocial development that often occurs around the age of 12. At this time, the adolescent begins to form a worldview that is a synthesis of the other important figures in their life, be they parents, first friendships, or puppy love relationships. Fowler states, and I quote, in stage three, synthetic conventional faith, a person's experience of the world now extends beyond the family. A number of spheres demand attention. Family, school or work, peers, street society and media, 
and perhaps religion. Faith must provide a coherent orientation in the midst of that more complex and diverse range of involvements, end quote. Referring back to his definition of faith, Fowler says that stage three faith, and I quote, structures the ultimate environment in interpersonal terms. Its images of unifying value and power derive from the extension of qualities experienced in personal relationships. It is a conformist stage in the sense that it is acutely tuned to the expectations and judgments of significant others, and as yet does not have a sure enough grasp on its own identity and autonomous judgment to construct and maintain an independent perspective, end quote. The word conformist, of course, reminds me of my old religious environment. Emphasis was placed on unity of thought and doctrinal agreement to protect the cohesion of the brotherhood. The result, of course, is that, as Fowler's definition of stage three implies, autonomous perspective building and moral judgment is almost completely disallowed. The expectations of others form the basis of spiritual authority in stage three. Fowler says that authority, and I quote, resides in the interpersonally available they, or in the certified incumbents of leadership roles and institutions, end quote. I think back to many times when lay people in my religious community would approach me for instruction on how to handle all sorts of personal matters, from education, employment, relationship, and or family advice. Authoritative expectations were freely given from local elders, the governing body, that is the spiritual leadership at headquarters, and written material published by the Watchtower Society. Beyond that, from the Bible, or from God. Regardless of the authority called upon, Fowler's point is that autonomous spiritual decisions are relegated to a body outside of the self. When it comes to personal identity development, Fowler states that during this stage, individuals develop the capacity for, and I quote, forming a personal myth of one's own becoming in identity and faith incorporating one's past and anticipated future into an image of the ultimate environment unified by characteristics of personality, end quote. That is to say that although autonomy is delegated to other parties and conformity may result, there's still a merging of this conformity with self-concept, such that a characteristic personality will develop, albeit not unique in relation to the rest of the community. This personality forms part of the ultimate environment of faith. Let's move on to stage four, individuative, reflective faith. It's during this faith development phase that, as Fowler puts it, and I quote, the late adolescent or adult must begin to take seriously the burden of responsibility for his or her own commitments, lifestyle, beliefs, and attitudes. The self, previously sustained in its identity and faith compositions by an interpersonal circle of significant others, now claims an identity no longer defined by the composite of one's roles or meanings to others, end quote. As a result, Fowler says, the person must face certain unavoidable tensions, individuality versus being defined by a group or group membership, subjectivity and the power of one's strongly felt but unexamined feelings versus objectivity and the requirement of critical reflection, self-fulfillment or self-actualization as a primary concern, versus service to and being for others, the question of being committed to the relative versus struggle with the possibility of an absolute, end quote. Looking back, the onset of traumatic symptoms that I experienced when my faith system crumbled, that I discuss in my book, A Voice From Inside, appear to fit within this stage four of Fowler's framework. The tension I experienced of separating my faith viewpoint from the community with which I had built my firmly held stage three faith and identity. Dangers exist here in the transition from stage three to stage four faith. Fowler says that there can be, and I quote, an excessive confidence in the conscious mind and in critical thought, and a kind of second narcissism in which the now clearly bounded reflective self over-assimilates reality and the perspective of others in its own worldview, end quote. Guilty. Let's move on. Stage five, conjunctive faith. Fowler states, and I quote, Conjunctive faith involves the integration into self and outlook of much that was suppressed or unrecognized in the interest of stage four self-certainty and conscious cognitive and affective adaption to reality, end quote. In this stage, there is a reframing and reworking of one's past and an opening to the voices of one's deeper self. 
And this stage includes a recognition of the unconscious social myths associated with one's socioeconomic class or ethnic group. Fowler says this stage is uncommon before midlife. It is a faith stage that is, and I quote, alive to paradox and the truth in apparent contradictions. The stage strives to unify opposites in mind and experience, end quote. This paradoxical understanding of truth can lead to either transcendence or cynical withdrawal. Fowler puts it this way, and I quote, The new strength of this stage comes in the rise of the ironic imagination, a capacity to see and be in one's or one's group's most powerful meanings, while simultaneously recognizing that they are relative, partial, and inevitably distorting apprehensions of transcendent reality. Its danger lies in the direction of a paralyzing passivity or inaction, giving rise to complacency or cynical withdrawal due to its paradoxical understanding of truth, end quote. It's as if the individual graduates to the philosopher or mystic's vision of paradoxical truth in this stage of faith. The individual becomes ironic in that they see the truths that are accepted by their group or by themselves personally are not universal or impervious from contradiction. The challenge is then for the individual to aggregate their lived experience in the previous faith stages and this new paradoxical truth into an imagined faith system that is still operational in their group. This makes me think of the moderating effect of the paradoxes included in Eastern spirituality and philosophy that have been incorporated into some accepted psychotherapeutic modalities. I'm going to be doing a podcast on this based on Alan Watts' book, Psychotherapy East and West. We also think of existential absurdity, the fluidity of the Tao Te Ching, and Kierkegaard's contrast with the ethical and ascetic. To the extent that these paradoxes are integrated into a system of values that, again, provide power, they can become a sort of faith system at Fowler's conjunctive level. Finally, we make it to the peak of Fowler's developmental faith perspective, the ever-elusive stage six, universalizing faith. What spiritual seeker would not want to have the confidence that their faith had transcended that of their tribe, including the multitudinous perspectives of neighboring groups and peoples, and reached the heights of the likes of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Mother Teresa? Fowler says that universalizing faith is just that. It has been through the crisis of conformity to a spiritual group, breaking from the group in stage four, reintegrating an appreciation of paradoxical truth in stage five, and now transcends to include value structures that not only embrace and absorb those of the community of man, but seek to improve them and move them towards spiritual liberation. Fowler cites from one of his earlier works, and I quote, Stage six is exceedingly rare. The persons best described by it have generated faith compositions in which their felt sense of an ultimate environment is inclusive of all being. They have become incarnators and actualizers of the spirit of an inclusive and fulfilled human community. They're contagious in the sense that they create zones of liberation from the social, political, economic, and ideological shackles we place and endure on human futurity. Living with felt participation in a power that unifies and transforms the world, universalizers are often experienced as subversive of the structures, including religious structures, by which we sustain our individual and corporate survival, security, and significance. Many persons in this stage die at the hands of those whom they hope to change. Universalizers are often more honored and revered after death than during their lives. The rare persons who may be described by this stage have a special grace that makes them seem more lucid, more simple, and yet somehow more fully human than the rest of us. Their community is universal in extent. Particularities are cherished because they are vessels of the universal and thereby valuable apart from any utilitarian considerations. Life is both loved and held too loosely. Such persons are ready for fellowship with persons at any of the other stages from any other faith tradition, end quote. The universalizers that come to mind are the ones who have become prominent leaders and therefore remembered by history. As was mentioned, this is because of the subversive nature of their visions. They also manifest what Fowler calls relevant irrelevance. That is to say that they commit themselves to a subversiveness that seems counter to what has been accepted as relevant by the societies that they are part of. The acts that they perform are often in the cause of universal justice and involve, and I quote, the negation of one's personhood or identification with the negations experienced by others, end quote. 
Their faith system includes values that not only provide an ethical frame, but also action to improve humankind toward a spiritual vision of what mankind could be, a spiritual ideal. This is not activism for its own sake or social disruption for irony's sake. This is the epitome of all faith traditions, a faith that is not bound by religion or even communal value systems. It expands upon accepted faith traditions in ways that offer a model that could easily be mapped to any system or group. I can't help but take a moment to self-reflect on whether I can sense the potential for this kind of universalized faith in myself, what it would look like, when and how it might manifest, spiritually, socially, or otherwise. Can you? I'm not going to lie, I feel a bit like I'm giving a sermon in this episode of Provisional Aspirations. The idea of maturing in our spirituality, developing more inclusive faith, and transcending the parts of ourselves that restrict our best parts is the kind of contemplation that yields awe for what one might become, the good that one might do for others, the small changes one might make to simultaneously benefit self, other, and humanity. It's enchanting. But it's not my intention to be thus. My reintroduction to Robert Fowler was from my counseling studies. He was called out for use with spiritually minded individuals who seek counseling and might need assistance as they face psychosocial crises and mature across a lifespan. Theoretical psychology has a tendency to lure us toward better versions of ourselves. Talk of authenticity, self-actualization from Maslow's humanist approach, and Robert Fowler's universalizing faith draw our minds away from the doggedly rational, the aridly neuroscientific, or the we're just apes on the savannah paradigm from evolutionary psychology that are more popular in the last decade or so. It tempts me to think that there is something more poetic to the understanding of human emotion, cognition, and behavior that our modern approaches take. If I'm ever to be a scientist or a clinician, I'll have to stop such magical thinking. But even for the ruthlessly scientific, political, materialistic, or mathematical in some secular worldview, it appears there could still be a tendency to imagine a universal environment and draw from it frameworks of value and power by which we determine our actions. Regardless of our religious, philosophical, political, or intellectual bent, Fowler's work somehow challenges us to wrest these from our unconscious minds and take another look. 